Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Salt Bitcoin Review. Uh, just a reminder, this is our weekly show we do every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time uh, that we go over uh, the latest news in Bitcoin, the latest happenings in Bitcoin, uh, the good and the bad. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin has been going through a bear market period, which is something that uh, VJ and Brett will be talking about on today's show. Uh, but we're we're overjoyed to have VJ back on the program or back on a salt program. He was on a salt talk previously. He was on Anthony's Mooch FM podcast, uh, and he's out with a fantastic new book that shares the name with his groundbreaking uh, essay on on Bitcoin called "The Bullish Case for Bitcoin." Uh, and and I'm I'm sure his book is doing fantastically well. Uh, one thing that Brett, Anthony, and I, and everybody here at Skybridge, that when when we're talking to people who are new to Bitcoin or looking to learn more about Bitcoin, really the first resource that we drive them to is VJ's essay, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, and now VJ's book, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. I think it it boils and distills everything down uh, to, to a very basic level, uh, but also uh, with a level of complexity uh, that I think is appropriate as well, uh, to just make people understand why Bitcoin isn't crazy, why it's the next iteration on the future of money, uh, You know, to, to go to digital money uh, based on historically what we've seen in terms of stores of value and currency and things like that, it makes perfect sense. But I'm joined today, uh, just to remind everyone, by Brett Messing, who's the president and chief operating officer at Skybridge Capital. Uh, we at Skybridge have a significant allocation to Bitcoin uh, with potentially further uh, investments in the digital asset space to come. Vijay Boyapati, again, is the author of The Bullish Case for Bitcoin, and we're, we're overjoyed to have you back, uh, Vijay, and welcome again. Thanks, John. And it's great to speak with both of you again today. Yeah, likewise. So the way this is going to go, I'm going to let Brett drive a lot of the conversation. BJ, I'm going to pipe in with a few questions here or there. Uh, but Brett, why don't you take it away uh, and get started with BJ? Sure. Thanks, VJ. It's awesome to see you. I, I forgot you're going to be here today. and I was really excited when uh, John uh, reminded me. Um, I missed last week's Salt Bitcoin review. I, I, I was I was on a silent meditation retreat and I came back and Bitcoin was 41,000. <laughs> Yesterday, I'm going to date stamp this. We're talking on, on June 23rd. It, it traded below 29,000. The clock behind you says it's at 32.9 right now. So be, fortunately, this is not a family program. So I'll just ask, like, what the fuck's going on in China, VJ? And what do you think about it? <sighs> Well, yeah, so partly this is precipitated by the Chinese ban on mining, and this is quite different to previous bans that the Chinese government has had on Bitcoin. Previous bans have been on exchanges, on trading, and things like that, which are easy kind of to turn on and off. Like you can ban trading or ban, um, turn. Uh, you can t tell the exchanges to shut off, and then you can come back and say, oh, actually, you can run your business. But shutting down mining is actually more significant that than that because you're 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 shutting off physical infrastructure. You're going and to, going to these computers and turning them off, and uh, th there's a huge cost to these miners to you know deploy the capital to buy all of these machines and all the, the all the money they put into paying for electricity for for Bitcoin mining, uh, and these miners are going to have to move that capital, the physical infrastructure out of China to other countries. And so this is not something the Chinese government can turn on or off. I think this is going to have a long-term impact on Bitcoin mining. I actually think this is really positive as a long-term development for Bitcoin. Uh, it's very it's negative for China. China was in a fantastic place. Uh, the that they were positioned in a great place for Bitcoin to become global money or to become digital gold because they had so much of the mining uh, capacity was centered in China. And at, at the stroke of a pen, they've just destroyed their position. They've said, you know, all the miners get out of our country. And so what's going to happen now is the mining infrastructure is going to be even more decentralized around the world. It's going to move to places like uh, Iceland or Texas or El Salvador. Uh, so this is really great for the health of the Bitcoin network. It's going to make it much more resilient and it's going to remove this centralization that's happened uh, where miners have all moved to China. And, and why did miners move to China? They moved there because the Chinese government, as a communist government, had massive overbuilt uh, their their energy infrastructure and um, communist governments aren't you know particularly good at allocating capital so they had these huge hydroelectric dams in in places like the Sichuan province in China 
uh, and excess capacity that wasn't being used by their population. And, and energy is not fungible. You can't take that excess energy and, and transmit it to Texas and have someone use it in Texas for something else. That energy was just being wasted. So Bitcoin miners gravitated towards that because, it, because the energy capacity had essentially been subsidized by the Chinese government. Very cheap electricity was available there. Uh, I think Ch the Chinese government is probably cracking down on corruption where lower and middle level bureaucrats in the communist party were were sort of uh using the, the energy as a black market to enrich themselves they could get miners to come over to where they were and and make some profit out of that because you could just directly monetize that cheap energy and i think the communist party it's not like a democracy right where if you have uh bad officials at at, at sort of the city local government level you just vote them out they have to fight corruption internally. Uh, so I think that was a cause of concern for them. Uh, and, and But I think they've really harmed themselves. I think uh, um, it's going to be very hard to convince miners to come back to China because miners are going to now really factor in geopolitical stability and, and whether or not they can trust the, uh, the government that they're taking their capital to, to, to deploy their mining hardware. So I think they're going to take a much closer look and, and say, you know, maybe electricity isn't quite as cheap in Texas. It's still cheap, but not quite as cheap as the Sichuan province, but I can trust the government in Texas. So I'm going to move my infrastructure there. I think this is a great thing long-term for Bitcoin, but short-term it's, it's kind of scary, right? You, you have all of this infrastructure being shut down by a government and that can spook the market a little bit. So it's funny, you know, this weekend is this, this story broke about mining and I, it made me super bullish, even if the price was, was weak for a couple of reasons. One, you know, when I first really engaged with Bitcoin and I'm not a technologist, but the idea of, a, of that there's over 50 percent of mining in Bitcoin and there's this thing called a 51 percent attack that's really bad. And it just took a while for me to get comfortable that those two that that risk wasn't so present the 51 percent attack by virtue of of uh all the mining being in china and, and it took you know again for a non-technologist it took a fair amount of investment of my time now imagine others you know just said forget it 50 percent, 50 so i think you know we get rid of that that narrative um i do want to talk about the greening you know how, how this this i think accelerates the, the path to a greener bitcoin mining and look, at the end of the day, just the, the pure resilience of the Bitcoin network, right? You know, that the largest country in the world shuts down half the computing power on the network, right? It just keeps going. That hashing power, I don't know, in several months will be back up to where it was, right? So just the resiliency um, uh, is incredible, right? And it just shows the, the you know how anti-fragile it is. That said... On Monday, there was another leg to the China story. And I, and I have to say, that I have my arms around this second leg a little less well than I did on the mining, which is this idea of Alipay and a few other banks being called in and essentially being told to crack down on customers using their services for cryptocurrency. C can you speak to this sort of second leg of the, the China? Because th that was the thing that really, you know, seem to trigger the decline below 30. Again, we've bounced back. Um, what was happening there and what's your take on it? Well, you know, China's banned Bitcoin so many times uh, that it, it's kind of hard for me to take it seriously. And I, I'm, I'm not even sure how easy it is for people in China to get hold of Bitcoin. I think the price movements in Bitcoin on the upside were not driven by China really at all. I think most of that was coming from the US and institutional investors and corporations. So I, I'm skeptical that that maybe just on the sentiment, it could change the sentiment a little bit, but I don't think in terms of actual volume of trade coming out of China that that would have made a, made a big difference. And I also think, you know, Bitcoin goes through these cycles. If you've been around in the Bitcoin market long enough, you've seen Bitcoin goes through these cycles where it'll go parabolic and then it'll have a correction and it'll have a period where it kind of finds a stable plateau. And then after the next sort of halving event, which is the, the Bitcoin supply shock that happens every four years, the, the parabolic move will start again. 
So I don't know whether we're in a bear market. You know, I don't, I don't know whether this is the beginning of a bear market and we have like a, a, a prolonged period where there's a plateau before the next the next big up move up for Bitcoin. But we know that this happens and we know that if your time period with Bitcoin is longer than two years, um, anyone who's held Bitcoin for three years or longer is sitting on a gain. If you have a short time frame, if you're looking to trade this as like a you know six month or one year thing, I I can't honestly tell you where it's going to be, and I think anyone who tells you they know where it's going to be is lying. Uh, but I, I've always been bullish on Bitcoin for for the long term because I think this is a really important fundamental innovation to money, and I'm sort of viewing it as something that's going to be incredibly important uh, to transforming the global financial system. Uh, over the period of decades. And I think this is something that's going to be really important for my kids and for my grandkids. So, you know, I don't really, I know people get really freaked out and worried about this, but if you zoom out and you sort of look on a longer time horizon, I'm not really concerned about this. It's just part of Bitcoin's monetization. And we've seen these cycles happen over and over again. We've, I think this might be the fourth or fifth cycle now. Um. Now, VJ, I don't want our audience to think that you're just a long-term thinker because I, I, I've spoken to you before and I've listened to you. And, and I think that you do understand the market psychology and what's going on in the market. You know, um, and So let's just talk about sort of the shape of the market right now. Mm -hmm. And I would say among the things that I found least interesting from the Bitcoin community were all these charts telling me where we are in the bull market, how high it's going to go based on a data set of two. Right. And so. Um, I have felt all along that this cycle will be different. Um, it would surprise me if, if this whole bull cycle is over, just given all that we've seen in terms of adoption. And, and, uh, um, and I, I think what led us down this conversation which we had before the, the, the show started is, is I said that in traditional markets, you know, a 10% pullback is a correction, a 20% is a bear market. And it's based on price, not time. So you could have a bear market that's a week, right? And once you go down 20 in the S&P, it's considered to be a bear market. And I said that we should change the sort of the lexicon in the in the crypto space because everyone keeps calling this a correction in a bull market. And my view is a 25% decline in crypto should be a, a pullback and 50% a bear market. So, um, you know, I was sort of saying, well, we're in a bear market. It might only last three weeks. And then you sort of suggested, no, we might be in a bear market that would carry us until the next halving, which is, you know, two and a half years hence. And 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 that surprised me that take of yours. Um, uh, so I guess if you could just expound a little bit on that, um, I, 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 you know, again, I, I find you to be very thoughtful about these things. I didn't think that you would throw out, you know, a crazy five hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollar price target like many do, but. Um, I guess your willingness to contemplate the, the possibility as being very real that we've entered a bear market was was a bit surprising to me. I, um, so you know, yeah, I mean, I I always like to take the most rationalistic perspective. I don't like to be a hype man because I feel like you know that that hurts my credibility and you know people. Um, my credibility matters a lot to me. So I want to try and describe things as they are rather than as I want them to be. I, you know, of course, I would love it if Bitcoin resumed the, the bull market. I think it is possible. We have to entertain the fact that uh, the bull market may have ended uh, and we have to wait a little while for it to come back. The reason I say that is, and again, I'm willing to be proven wrong on this. When you get these parabolic moves, um, Bitcoin has been able to sustain corrections up to 38 or 40% in prior bull markets. Um, it, it, it's just very damaging psychologically, I think, in a market when, when the market falls 50 or more percent. And the, the reason I say that is because people's mindset in a bull market, especially the parabolic phase of the bull market, is that when a dip happens, I'm ready to buy I, because I missed out on the opportunity previously and I want to get in and, and I believe this is going to get higher. So I'm getting in cheap now. If that psychological psychology flips and turns to, oh, this might be the end of the bull market. People sell rallies. They, when a rally comes, they'll, they'll they'll try and escape their position. And there are people who may have bought Bitcoin, say, uh, from forty five thousand to sixty five thousand, who are just looking for an escape hatch because they they're sitting on losses and they they don't want to lose any more money. Uh, 
I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. Certainly we have, if you look at the 2013 bull market, we had this really interesting sort of two-phase bull market where Bitcoin went from, I think it was $30 to $250, and then it crashed more than 50%. It crashed to, I think, $50. Um, and there was a period for a couple of months where it stayed fairly low, and then it went up to 1000 So that's also a possibility, right? That could happen. I, I can't say with you know a straight face that I know exactly how things are going to play out, whether it's going to be closer to 2017 and this is the end of the bull market because we've had a 50% correction, or if it's going to be like 2013 where we'll, we'll resume. But I think we have to at least entertain the possibility that this we are in, in, in a bear market. I think if you look at sort of the macro picture, it's still very positive for Bitcoin. If you look at the adoption uh, curve for Bitcoin is still very positive. And something happened that I didn't think was going to happen this cycle or even for a, a number of cycles, which was the making of Bitcoin as, uh, as legal tender in El Salvador. I think that's a stunning development. It's incredibly important. Uh, and I think it's going to sort of serve as an example for other countries, uh, especially in Latin America, who are going to see the example of El Salvador and see the, the success I believe it's going to bring their country, uh, especially because, you know, there are a lot of poorer rural parts of El Salvador where they don't have good banking infrastructure. All of these people now can sort of trade this digital money just by having an internet connection, which I think is a very powerful thing. And they'll be able to trade Bitcoin um, without any friction. There's no, because it's legal tender, there's going to be no taxation on transferring your Bitcoin to someone else. Whereas in the US, there's a huge friction to, to trading your Bitcoin for goods and services. So people don't use it in that way. Uh, if you buy Bitcoin at say $100 and the value goes up to 500 and you buy something with it, you buy some, some, some groceries at the store, you owe tax on that gain. So that's a, that's a big friction to using Bitcoin in that way. I think Bitcoin will be adopted uh, in this way in El Salvador very quickly, both because the friction is gone and also because there's huge kind of uh, marketing value from having a president who's pushing this as a policy. Uh, and as adoption grows in El Salvador, I think that in time over the period of a couple of years, the savings, uh, the value of those savings are going to grow. And neighboring countries are going to see this and say, well, El Salvador is enriching themselves. The people are enriching themselves by having their savings in Bitcoin. Maybe we should consider legalizing uh, Bitcoin in our country. So I'm, I'm very positive on the macro picture. I just, I, I am not sure how this is going to play out over the short term. I'm being, you know, very open and honest about that. Right. You know, um, Oddly, I'm actually, I think, in the, in, the, in the shorter term, more bullish than you are. Um, you know, Bitcoins took quite a blow over the last several months, right? We had the ESG sort of attack, if you will. Although I, I think that Elon Musk's comments and his approach, while inelegant, is going to be very good for Bitcoin because there is an attention, right, on greening mining in a way that, that didn't exist without him. I wish he'd handled it differently, but he did. He, you know, he didn't. But I think it'll be it'll be helpful. But but there was that attack vector. The ransomware stuff freaks people out, right? The fact that Bitcoin again, you know, uh, the former CIA director issued a report and showed that, you know, the the when people saying that Bitcoin is used for illicit activity is, is sort of a, a Silk Road 2013 take. But Colonial Pipeline was a big deal. Right. And, 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 and it's and is, you know, the growing number of ransomware attacks. And it's, it's bad from a narrative standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's China ban and, you know, the hash power going down, you know, being, you know, it's a lot to throw at it. And yet we sit here and it's up over 10 percent year to date. Um, and it's still small enough. And this is where you got to be careful. I don't want sort of hope um, like a single actor can make a difference here. Right. You know, no one saw Michael Saylor coming. Um, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust was an, an important market dynamic in the fall. Um, yep. uh, and what I think the market needs, and I love your thoughts on this, is I'm, and I'm not sort of hoping that another Michael Saylor walks through the through the door. But what I'm looking for is is. It doesn't need to be sexy, but something that changes the supply demand dynamic a little bit, because, you know, at least. Again, from a trading standpoint, that seems to be, um, I think what we need is just sort of, you know, some kind of steady buying interest. Um, 
And, you know, just, I guess we, we just haven't seen that. Um, you know, the banks have been a little slower in rolling out products and the uptake's been slower. But do you have any thoughts on where, uh, where the next sort of incremental demand might be coming from? Well, you, you mentioned something that I think is an incredibly important uh, factor in, in the market dynamics now that most people haven't thought about, which is uh, Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust, G- GBTC, which owns a very, very large fraction of all existing Bitcoins. And, and the influence they had on the, the bull market uh, when, it was, when it was really increasing very rapidly is they acted as an accelerant because there was this premium to the, the, the trust. And the, the dynamic was that uh, that trust with that premium as people were buying more of the trust, they were going out and, and buying in the spot market to, to add to their, uh, their, their Bitcoin position. When, when the premium turned negative, that has two negative effects. When someone buys GB, GBTC, they don't need to go and buy more Bitcoin. So they're not buying in the spot market anymore. And because there's such a large discount on GBT, GBTC, uh, people who want to invest in Bitcoin, uh, they can they can buy the trust at, at a discount to NAV, uh, a 20% discount to NAV and get exposure to Bitcoin that way in the hope that you know, eventually that becomes an ETF. So when someone chooses to get exposure to Bitcoin uh, via GBDC, when there's a, a, a discount to NAV, it means that that trust isn't buying on the spot market and that investor isn't buying on the spot market. So neither of them are affecting the spot price. So when the premium goes negative, it it's like a, a a break or a decelerant, whereas when it's positive, it accelerates the bull market. So and that, that, that is actually, I think people don't talk about this very much, but that, that fund has a, a lot of uh, influence on the market. And I think watching that premium and where that premium goes uh, is, is really important. And one thing that could, you know, flip this very quickly uh, and would take, get, get that premium up and get it to uh, to zero or slightly positive is if that fund gets approved as an ETF. Uh, I don't know whether that's going to happen. I don't have any insight onto the, the, the regulatory landscape of whether they're, they're shifting their perspective on approving an ETF, but that would instantly sh- shift that sort of negative factor that's sitting in the market right now where investors are saying, well, I don't want, I don't, don't need to buy spot. I can buy GBDC. And th- so the spot price just kind of lags because of that. There's no one sitting in the spot market uh, accumulating supply when they can get exposure in a different way. Uh, so, you know, that's one factor. And of course, we could have someone else come in and say, hey, I'm I'm really bullish on Bitcoin. We could get another uh, uh, Paul Tudor Jones or Drucker Miller. We could get someone else coming in who's bullish. Or we could have another country saying we're making it uh, legal tender. We don't know. These things seem to come out of nowhere. Like I had no idea that El Salvador was going to uh, make Bitcoin legal tender. I had no idea that this bull market would be characterized by someone like Michael Saylor, who's gone all in, like as all in as you could go as the CEO of a company, as a public company. Not only has he bought Bitcoin with his treasury, but he's like leveraged his company by buying, uh, by issuing bonds and using that to buy Bitcoin. So we don't know. Uh, these things can come out of nowhere, just like you say. Uh, but I, I would just agree with what you said that, and I want to emphasize that point. GBTC is a really important factor in the market dynamic right now that most people have not even thought about. You know, that's interesting. It's a very, it's a very interesting perspective. Um, I, you know, again, I, I, I think that another great investor embrace, I think we're, you know, we, we have our like Mount Rushmore of investors blessing it. Again, I, my personal view is, you know, we, we need buyers, right? You know what I mean? And, um, you know, what I'm hoping, you know, in the same way Michael Saylor started and then just got more and more committed, you know, to Bitcoin, it's incredible what he's done. I'm, I'm hoping El Salvador puts it on their, on their balance sheet, which is how I thought a country would you know, I think they read they have three billion dollars in, in in reserves. I mean, if they bought a hundred million dollars in Bitcoin, um, uh, I think that would be good. And I think it might open the door to other nations who might not want to go the legal tender route, but you know, see it as a, as an asset that makes sense for them to hold on the on their balance sheets. Yeah, and absolutely, I think it makes sense if you think about 
uh, you know, the recent history of a country like Venezuela, whatever you think of their uh, president, President Maduro, I, you know, I'm certainly not a fan of him. But when a country like Venezuela tries to repatriate its gold from the Bank of England and England just says, no, you can't have your gold back as a, as a nation state. I mean, that sort of serves notice that nations need to have some kind of asset which is easily tradable, easily transmitted, uh, which is globally valuable, that they can easily custody themselves. Because you know, if I am a nation, I'm a leader of a nation like Venezuela, I'm going to feel scared having my assets held or custodied by another country. And Bitcoin is really the ideal sort of store of value uh, in that situation. I just, I don't think they've re realized this yet. They haven't recognized it as that, but eventually they will. Well, I do have to say, I, I, I'm glad that El Salvador went first because, you know, it, it seems like a cute country with the surfing and the beach. I was a little concerned it would be North Korea or, you know, yep. someone that from a marketing too. standpoint, um, you know, I was talking to Nick Carter about where, you know, other, actually be interesting your take on this. There's this massive opportunity in Bitcoin mining, right? You've got, you know, half of the hash rate, you got rigs for sale, for sale. You know, it seems to me you could see a large industrial company, right? Anyone from General Electric to Honeywell to Verizon to Google, so Tesla say, you know, we can get into this in scale. And I, I asked him, you know, where he thought that might be coming from. And he suggested that the energy companies are well positioned to do it. And I was like, no, 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 no. The PR department of Bitcoin says we don't want Exxon Mobil mining for Bitcoin. But uh, I guess my question would be, do you see that as a possibility that we would see a new entrant, someone, you know, sizing this up? Potentially, you know, I haven't thought about that too deeply, but I think there is, I agree with you that there's a massive opportunity in mining right now, just because it's been so badly disrupted by this regulatory shock uh, that you have this, you know, massive outflow of infrastructure out of China right now. I saw a, a funny tweet on uh, Twitter where uh, uh, one of the largest miners in uh, China, uh, he, he had a tray of brisket and ribs and, and, you know, Texas barbecue in front of him because he was in Austin, Texas, looking to move his infrastructure to Texas. Uh, so I, I'm not entirely sure whether this is all going to be sold off and bought up by a, an energy company. I, I think it's more likely that these miners are just looking around the world for places that are friendly to their business so they can move their infrastructure there. And I think a lot of them are looking in the U S right now. Uh, if, if, if it's, you know, it's something that you've been interested in and you're wanting to, you know, start a mining business, I think now would be a great time because obviously the hash rate has dropped uh, a huge amount and, and it's even more profitable to mine Bitcoin right now. So I think uh, it's a great time to be thinking about mining and whether to start a business in the space. I don't know who's going to do it, but I'm, I'm sure this is also going to illustrate the resiliency of Bitcoin. As you say, uh, we have this massive regulatory shock, but Bitcoin is resilient to that. And it's just the, the hash power is just going to shift out of the, out of China into other countries. And we're going to see the, the, the security of the network is going to start ramping up again in the next couple of months as that hardware comes out and, and finds energy, cheap energy sources around the world. So this morning, I, I, I happen to see how the prices are sort of really plummeting for mining hardware. And the first email I sent was to Skybridge's CFO with a question, do we pay for our power separately or is it bundled into the rent? Because it was bundled into the rent, I was thinking we should buy a bunch of these, you know, mining rigs and start start mining. And uh, um, uh, in fact, Chad Casarella of Paxos did that in Manhattan years ago before his landlord sort of shut him down. Um, right. So the landlords of Manhattan are hip. Yeah. So we, our Con Ed bill is broken out. We will not be running a mining operation here in Manhattan. But the question was asked. Let it be. Let it be said. Um, and New York isn't really New York isn't really a friendly environment towards mining. I think states like Texas and and Florida are probably much more friendly. Even where I live in Washington State, um, 
has relatively good conditions for mining. I mean, the electricity is, we have a lot of hydroelectric power. It's very cheap in Wenatchee, which is a few hours uh, uh, east of, of Seattle. But for, at least from my understanding, the regulatory picture in New York isn't very friendly towards mining. So it's a little unfortunate, I think, but uh, there are a lot of places in the US where it's, it's great to mine and there is a lot of mining infrastructure. Right, right. And, and, and sort of stability, as you pointed out, which I think is going to be really important right, for the miners. So we ordered a bunch of your, your books. We're, we're waiting for them. They haven't arrived. Um, before, before I let John take a shot at you and we take some questions, uh, you know, you want to tell us a little bit about the update? You know, I've, uh, um, I've read, you know, your, your, your piece, which as John said is, you know, has become, I think, you know, the, the Bible, um, several times. And I'm looking forward to see the things that you've added, uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm grateful that you gave me the opportunity to talk about it. I want to give an update, uh, but, I, you know, people supported me on Kickstarter. I don't want to spam them too much with up, updates, so I'm doing it like every week or, or two weeks. I launched it on Kickstarter because I feel like it's a much more direct way to get to people who are interested in the book without going through a publisher. Uh, and I, I got a lot of support. I'm really grateful and excited about that. I have already written the book and uh, it's it's mostly done in typeset. I'm just going um, iterating with the printer right now to make sure the quality of the print is uh, exactly the way I want it. I printed some advanced copies for the Miami Bitcoin conference and I, and I um, sold them to folks who were at the conference, but there were a few small print errors that I wasn't happy with. So, so in a way, those those copies are like collector's editions because they're not they're like the stamp that was upside down that became worth a lot of money. Um, I'm hoping that I can get all these shipped out um, before the end of July. In, in Kickstarter, I said um, I, that I will, my date was September, but I'm going to try and get it done much sooner than that. As soon as I've got this last iteration on the print quality to where I want it to be, I'm going to start shipping them out. And, you know, I was really uh, excited and grateful to see Anthony had bought a bunch of copies. Uh, so I, I'm, I can't wait to get the copies to you. I think you guys are going to like it or love it. Um, the, the book just feels, uh, I don't know, if, it just feels nice to have something tangible in your hands. It's all, almost an extra level of credibility over, you know, an article on Medium. Uh, and, and it's just, it has beautiful artwork in it that was uh, done by uh, an artist for me. So I, I'm really proud of it and, and I'm excited to get it out. So hopefully in the next few weeks, I'm going to start shipping those books out um, and, and you guys can read them and, you know, give them to your clients. Well, congratulations. We're, we're excited to do so. All yeah. right. We're going to fire in some Q&A from the audience here, VJ. Uh, the first one from an anonymous attendee. How do you see this recent rough patch or bear market or correction, whatever you want to call it for Bitcoin, how is it different uh, than previous corrections, given now that it has more mainstream adoption uh, and appeal than it did during those previous pullbacks? Yeah, so this market is interesting because when when the bull market started, and I, I started writing about this being a bull market in mid-2019, and I said, we're in a bull market now. Um, and I, and I wrote some long threads on Twitter about what bull markets look like and how, how you can characterize them. One thing I was a little bit surprised by was how quickly the bull market moved. Uh, if there was quite a stretch of time when it was moving faster than 2017. The price appreciation was faster in 2017. And that's something I didn't expect because Bitcoin kind of exists at scale now. It's a, it's almost a trillion dollar asset. So I, I would have thought things would progress a, a little more slowly. Um, you know, we've had this correction and I, I'm also a little bit surprised by the correction because it happened earlier than I thought. I thought this bull market would extend into the end of the year. Some people have said, and I think it's entirely plausible, that this is going to be like 2013, where we have a mini bear market uh, and then we resume the bull market later in the year. That That's certainly possible. And I think the macro factors are supportive of that with the you know uh, adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender in a nation state. That's a huge development. Um, and, and Michael Saylor is sort of sitting back there with a billion dollars behind to, to use a poker term. He, he's got a billion dollars waiting to come into the market. 
Uh, I think if Bitcoin stabilizes around uh, around these prices now, then it's certainly possible that we could that the bull market could resume later on in the year. So it's it's that's an open question for me. Do prices stabilize around this level, or or does the correction go go a bit deeper than we've seen so far? So we have another anonymous question. Uh, it's about about China, which we talked about in the opening, but. Peter Thiel came out several months ago and he said that we can't discount the notion that Bitcoin is a Chinese financial weapon aimed at dethroning the U.S. dollar's hegemony around the world. Um, You know, obviously their decision to outright ban mining, outright ban any aspect of of decentralized crypto in their economy pokes a hole in that theory. But were you surprised from a geopolitical perspective that China didn't lean into Bitcoin uh, as another answer to the dollar, sort of? making the dollar fight a multi-front war against the yuan and Bitcoin and other currencies, the euro. Uh, how do you yeah. look at that? Yeah, there's a great irony in that the United States has the most open and friendly regulatory position uh, towards Bitcoin because the United States really, if you think about it long term, has the most to lose. The United States has the world's reserve currency and really should want to defend that position for the benefit it gets from having that. Uh, And other countries, I mean, Charles de Gaulle in the 60s really uh, railed against the US for winning itself exorbitant privilege, having the world's reserve currency and being able to export its inflation around the world. And he, Charles de Gaulle wanted to go back on a gold standard because of this. So it is kind of ironic that countries like uh, Russia and, and China have being less friendly from a regulatory perspective and they haven't sort of seen the they haven't recognized the geopolitical significance of bitcoin and and they they're more concerned with its effect on their internal markets um the interesting thing about china is if you think about it almost from a I'm, i'm joking a little bit but from a conspiratorial perspective china has been a huge friend to Bitcoin, like they they massively overbuilt their energy infrastructure and provided cheap electricity to Bitcoin and and sort of helped secure the Bitcoin network for the first decade of its existence. And at the point where Bitcoin's mining became so concentrated in China that it was a little bit scary, right? You want a decentralized system. China was like, okay, we're banning mining and we're forcing all these miners to go all over the world, which decentralizes Bitcoin's mining. So if you think about it from that perspective, China has almost been the greatest ally to Bitcoin, like getting it to the point where it's geopolitically significant. And then at the point where it's too centralized in China, they force it to decentralize. So, you know, I I almost think of it, I don't think they were thinking about it in those terms, but they've been a a great ally to Bitcoin if if you think about those, uh, those factors. Well, let me just add something to that, VJ. Some people have said, you know, is the Bitcoin uh, mining ban like China playing three-dimensional chess, right? That it, it helps Bitcoin and therefore undermines the dollar. Um, I am not. I do not believe that. Although I certainly agree with your conclusion that um, perhaps by happenstance, everything they've done has been helpful for Bitcoin. Yeah, I completely agree. I don't think it's purposeful. And I only sort of say this as a joke, but if you were looking at it from a you know 10,000 foot perspective out in space, you'd say, wow, China really loves Bitcoin. Uh, they're doing everything possible to make sure Bitcoin is a success. But at the same time, they're harming themselves. So that they're, they're doing this in very strange uh, almost it appears altruistically, but clearly that's not what's going on. They, they, they're concerned about their internal political dynamic and stamping out corruption or whatever whatever they're associating Bitcoin with. Because to, to them, Bitcoin is too small to care about. Like the, if you're very high up in the Chinese Communist Party, you're not really thinking about Bitcoin. You're thinking that uh, low level corruption in the Communist Party is a problem. How is corruption happening? Well, they're using black market energy to, to enrich themselves through Bitcoin. So stamp out Bitcoin. That, I think, is probably the most likely explanation for what happened. Uh, but uh, to our benefit, I, I think it really helps the health of the Bitcoin network. And also to the point you made, I think it's going to get Bitcoin moving to um, much greener sources around the world. Yeah, as Brett alluded to earlier, it's almost, you know, there was one concern about China having too much of a monopoly on Bitcoin mining and too much control of the network. Uh, Now we're concerned that China's banning it. So one problem out the window, uh, another one created. I think it's a net positive. Anthony tweeted as much uh, earlier in the week, and I think Brett feels the same way. But uh, we talked about El Salvador. Ano in the chat is talking about remittances. So 
El Salvador, there's a couple different things they did uh, when they adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. But I think the most direct benefit is the impact it has on the remittance market. So Brett uh, was deputy mayor of LA and has spoken about this in some recent SALT talks we've done. It's an obvious use case for Bitcoin in terms of improving the efficiency of remittances and, and growing the GDP, frankly, of El Salvador, because the net amount of proceeds from remittances from inside the United States is much higher. Is that sort of, in your opinion, and this is a question from the audience, is that a killer application of Bitcoin that you think is a game changer that other countries are going to look at El Salvador and say, wow, this is a tremendous use case and they're going to adopt it for that reason? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that was probably a big motivating factor for uh, the president and, and the people involved in El Salvador, because that, that payment rail, the remittance rail is so inefficient you know, I think there are cases where people are only getting, uh, you know, 70 or even 50 percent of the money that they're sending back to the communities that they're trying to support in their, their home country. Uh, so that, that's a big benefit. And I think they had this experiment in, you know, a village or a couple of villages in El Salvador where people were starting to uh, uh, help adoption in the village for people to accept Bitcoin and maybe to take remittances from people overseas. And there's also this um, company Strike, which allows people to use the Lightning Network, which is a very cheap way of sending Bitcoin uh, 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 payments and, and connecting it to exchanges on both sides. So it, it's almost invisible to the people using uh, using the Bitcoin. They don't know what's happening underneath, but someone buys Bitcoin with US dollars and it gets transmitted using the Lightning Network very cheaply and then it gets sold on the other end for their local currency, which they get. So it's a much more efficient way of, of transmitting value. You know, I, I'm not entirely sure that this is the big use case for Bitcoin. I think it's certainly the cherry on top, but I still see the, the big use case of Bitcoin as being a store of value. Um, a non-sovereign store of value where people can keep their savings that can't be debased. And I think the macro environment is that we live in unprecedented uh, economic times where the, the, the monetary policy of governments around the world is, there's no historical precedent to have government bonds trading at, at negative interest rates and to have you know short-term interest rates set at zero for prolonged periods of time. So I uh, I, I don't I personally don't think this can end well and I think people are gonna you know jump to something like Bitcoin as a, as a lifeboat when this this whole system unwinds because I, I just don't see how it's possible this this can last uh, for a prolonged period of time where trillions literally trillions of dollars of government bonds are tr trading at negative interest rates I, I don't honestly don't know who is putting money into these bonds uh, and negative yields. Um, so I think the primary use case for Bitcoin is still a store of value. Uh, I think it's helpful for remit remittances. I don't think it's a huge part of uh, the demand source of demand for Bitcoin right now, but it, it could grow over time. And I think that's the, the cherry on top. VJ RJ uh, in the chat has a question about the stock to flow model. So the stock to flow model that Plan B, uh, the pseudonymous contributor on Twitter, he's a, a works for a Dutch pension, or at least used to before he uh, left to focus full-time on Bitcoin. That model has been eerily accurate in terms of predicting the trajectory of Bitcoin. We're now in the lower band. We're still within uh, you know, the band for the stock-to-flow model, but we're in the lower band. Uh, do you lend a lot of credence to the stock-to-flow model? Uh, and do you think that could be a potential you know, path uh, for, for Bitcoin to bounce, just following the mechanics of that theory? I've always been a little hesitant to subscribe to any model which says it can know with certainty what will happen in the future. The one thing I do really believe about stock to flow is that I really think that Bitcoin's halving cycle is the primary driver of these hype cycles. The supply shock that happens every four years, I think, triggers these bull markets. And I think that's really part of the sort of underlying parameters of this stock to flow model is, is that uh, the flow is being reduced by half. And so that's going to have an effect on the price. Whether or not it has a very predictable effect on the price, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's been, like you say, it's been eerily accurate. And 
I have been uh, surprised by how accurate it's been. It remains to be seen, and I think over the next few months, we're going to see if it continues to be accurate. I really think Plan B, if it continues to be accurate for even like three or four more years, you should almost be considered for a Nobel Prize in economics because this is stunning that you could you could you know chart the trajectory of an asset from zero to a trillion dollars with such accuracy. Um, uh, I, I think it's incredible that it's been true for as long as it has been. Hey, so I have a question on that. So there are about 18.7 million Bitcoin outstanding, right? I, I think in 2025, there'll be 20 million of the 21 million Bitcoin outstanding. So each reduction in supply is by definition substantially less significant mathematically. So wouldn't you think that this dynamic would either end or, you know, just be far less pronounced? In other words, this, have we possibly outgrown bear, bull and bear cycles? Well, we will. It's in the future, right? I, I, I don't know if you would agree that 25 years from now, I don't know that anyone's going to care about the having cycle. I guess the yeah, that, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, while the, the, the rate of inflation is decreasing, the price level during these cycles goes up so much that inflation again becomes significant just because it's it's not the fraction of Bitcoins that are being produced. What matters is the purchasing power of those Bitcoins have gone up so much that you have this constant flow onto the market from miners selling their Bitcoins. Because remember, miners are marginal producers. They have to sell their Bitcoins to, to, to recoup the energy cost of mining. So they're constantly producing these Bitcoins that have to go onto the market. And because the price of Bitcoin has gone up so much, you need people who are willing to, to absorb that supply. Uh, so, so even though the inflation rate might be only 2 or 3%, the, the total value of those Bitcoins coming onto the market per per day is like in the order of millions of dollars, right? You need millions of dollars of inflow to keep the price stable, just to, to just to make up for the, the supply that's coming off from miners. Uh, so, so what happens is you get the price going parabolic, it reaches a climax and it goes higher than is really supportable or sustainable by the market. And then the price collapses down to a level where the market is willing or able to sustain the amount of value that's being produced by the miners. Um, and then after you know a few years, you get the next supply shock. And because the amount being produced by miners halves, um, that, that excess of demand over supply gets the, the price moving again and gets it in, in, into the next cycle. So even though you know, you're correct that the total amount of inflation relative to the total supply is small, the price goes up so much that that inflation still needs to be absorbed by someone. Understood. Agree. All right, VJ, we're going to leave it there. It's always a pleasure to have you on Salt Talks or the Salt Bitcoin Review. Just a reminder, everybody, uh, the bullish case for Bitcoin, his fantastic essay has been turned into a book of the same name, The Bullish Case for Bitcoin. You can find it on Kickstarter. You can expect it to be delivered uh, somewhere uh, mid late July, if I heard you correctly, yep. VJ. Yep, and so I'll, I'll have it. In, I'll, I'll have it in Amazon hopefully by the end of July as well, so people can go go to Amazon to get it. All right, fantastic. So your skeptical uncle, uh, you know, if you have him at the dinner table, get a copy of that book, give it to him, and let him learn a thing or two about the history of money and why digital money in the form of Bitcoin with no no government backing it uh, is potentially the future. But thank you, VJ, for joining us. Thanks, Brett. And thanks, John. It's awesome chatting with you guys again. Thank you, VJ. And I'm going to call yesterday the VJ boy of potty bottom. And we'll see. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I turn bearish, you got to be bullish. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'll never turn bearish on Bitcoin over any long period of time. And and I've, I've not sold any. So, you know, I, I don't... Uh, these things don't affect me. Once once you've been through a few of these, your nerves get so hardened. I have nerves of steel now that, you know, it would take much more than a 50% drop to, to, to get me sweating. Well, I have to say, I'm a hands boy a potty. All good. right. Take care, everyone. <laughs> take care, PJ. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Cheers.